Hello, welcome to Aquaculture in the Northeast. My name is Gal Hachman and I'm a professor at Vatwes University. I'm also a current board chair of the Council on Food, Agricultural and Research Economics. It's CIFER's mission to translate high level research and knowledge to a diverse audience that includes policymakers, elected officials and federal administrators. When we demonstrate the value of the profession to these groups, the Council increases public appreciation for research, extension, outreach, and academic programs in agriculture and applied economics. Today's webinar is the product of a recent partnership between the Northeastern Agriculture and Research Economic Association and CIFER. Without NARIA's support, this event would not be possible. Next. Just before we begin, a quick word of thanks to our partners. This and other CFAIR programming wouldn't be possible without the continuing support of the Agriculture and Applied Economics Association. With the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistical Service, NAS, as well as the Department's Economic Research Service, ERS, we are greatly indebted to these three organizations. This event is also supported by the Northeastern Agriculture and Research Economic Association and Farm Credit East. Next. Now let's talk about our panelists. Robert Wold is the executive director of the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association. He has also served on NOAA's Marine Fisheries Advisory Council and now sits on NOAA's Science Advisory Board. Next, Deborah Butcher is a director of the University of Maine's Aquaculture Research Institute and an assistant professor of aquatic animal health with University of Maine's Cooperative Extension. Next. Timothy, Timothy Sullivan is a national program leader of animal production systems at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Next. Tessa Getches is an extension specialist with Connecticut Sea Grant University of Connecticut extension program. Next. Mike DeLuca is the Senior Associate Director in the Office of Research at the New Jersey Agriculture Experiment Station, which is a part of Rutgers University. Our first speaker is Robert Rolt. So today I'm gonna to be giving an overview of the shellfish aquaculture industry on the East Coast. Slide please. And, uh, it's a very diverse industry, but just to give you a brief snapshot, we've got about 1,300 farms from Maine to Florida. Uh, the vast majority are small farmers with less than 10 employees collectively harvesting close to $170 million worth of clams and oysters. And production has been growing rapidly, uh, well, right up until this past year. And the big news was that oyster production has doubled in the past five years. Clam production has been relatively flat, although we did see a nice pop in price in 2019. So we do expect more growers to be getting into producing clams again. And we have uh, a small, but um, hopefully growing uh, mussel production uh, going on in Northern New England um, with some challenges there. Slide please. So uh, just going through by state, um, you can see that there's a, a big disparity in production between the various states. For instance, if you look at you know, Virginia and North Carolina, the, the difference there is not because the waters are different or because the people are less ambitious. It's the regulatory structure that tends to affect how much uh, production is going on in each state. And so you know, while some states have a regulatory structure that's quite conducive, some states have uh, created regulations that essentially make it very challenging to do any aquaculture at all. Slide, please. And it's a very diverse industry that has changed quite a bit in just the last 30 odd years since I've been involved. Um, 
with uh, these are pictures of bottom ground shellfish uh, from Connecticut. And, and that was the dominant form of aquaculture until really the invention of plastics in the late 80s allowed us uh, to, to develop other techniques. Slide please. It allowed us to have uh, wi uh, vinyl coated wire and plastic mesh allowed us to do uh, cages uh, and so various rack and bag techniques um, and a, a really, a, a, I call it an adaptive radiation of growing methods. Slide please. We also developed hatchery reared lines uh, that allowed us to, you know, exploit differences in uh, disease resistance, which allowed uh, growers, say in Virginia, where disease had ravaged the oyster population to now get back into oyster culture. Um, and then we've got, you know, development more recently. Um, when I sold my farm, they developed uh, something called the oyster grow cage. Um, but we've got a wide variety of different techniques that have been tried and are, are being uh, continually new techniques are rolling out. Slide, please. And um, here you see the oyster grow cage, which was developed about uh, 13 years ago, it really facilitates a lot of, uh, it's a low labor um, method that provides really great um, shell shape and, and high meat quality and excellent survival in comparison to some of the bottom cages. Um, of course, you know, when you put these out in the water, it does create uh, navigation hazards and it is right in your face if you are a waterfront homeowner, so it creates some permitting challenges. Slide, please. And um, and then there's uh, most recently we've seen uh, coming out of Australia a couple of different designs called the Australian Longline System. Um, this is being uh, deployed in various areas and, and again has um, many advantages in terms of uh, cutting back on the labor required to cut down on the fouling, which cuts back on the flow. So um, slide please. So we've seen this, um, you know, and then um, one more is uh, the flip bag. And when the tide comes in, the buoy flips these bags up into the other shape. So, uh, so the, the bags are going up and down with each tide, tossing the animals inside. And it, it really rounds up the animal and, and you get a really great meat texture. And a, again, um, it can be a navigation hazard and some people don't like looking at it, but it's a great way to grow oysters. Slide please. So we've got, uh, you know, these challenges, uh, but the floating gear is, is really showing us that we are getting really good, high, or higher survival. And I'm talking, you know, 10 to 20% mortality instead of 40 to 60% in a bottom cage, which I, if I ever saw that kind of um, survival, I would be um, probably still oyster farming. Um, but anyway, um, it does create permitting challenges because of the aesthetics. Um, the navigation challenges, and uh, of course, birds like to sit on the floating gear, so um, there are challenges there as well. And um, there also can be, you know, use conflicts um, that generate lawsuits. So this is my new, not my new normal is dealing with the, this world. Slide, please. But we have, uh, you know, some of the challenges that are keeping us from expanding our industry are, are um, conflicts with various protected resources issues, whether it's eelgrass or red knots, sturgeons, you know, it's the right whale, um, which is uh, threatened or perhaps endangered now, which is blocking the expansion of mussel farming in New England. Um, I got eelgrass on there twice because it's obviously a big deal. Uh, so um, we have a lot of uh, new regulations coming up. Uh, the FDA has decided we need to uh, close areas around mooring fields. And you know we had tremendous impacts when COVID hit. Um, we knew we were dependent on restaurant sales for most of our marketing, but I, did, I had no idea it was 98% of our sales were going to be dependent on that. So um, the we had some great relief programs. We managed to get access to CFAP2 and, and PPP, and that really saved a lot of farms from going under. We expect we'll have to do more. Um, there will be hopefully more uh, relief because we are not expecting restaurants to snap back. Something like 110,000 restaurants in the US are closed. Half of the restaurants in New York City and Chicago 
Um, so we are still going to be challenged with marketing uh, going forward. Um, but hopefully once people get vaccinated and feel like they're safe to go back to a restaurant, um, our sales should recover nicely. Slide, please. And so we do a lot of things uh, through the ECSGA. We have a very active listserv, a very good uh, newsletter. Uh, I do a lot of public outreach and education. We have a, a very good website with a tremendous amount of information on there. And um, I probably should be doing a better job of Facebook and tw Twittering and Instagramming. Um, but it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. But I certainly encourage you, if you have questions about shellfish aquaculture, to, to visit our website. Um, there's a vast amount of information there. Slide, please. And I think that's it. Oh, these are our legislative priorities going forward this year. Um, we are trying to get an exemption to the Jones Act so that we don't have to pay for workers' comp insurance twice. Um, we're pushing back on the FDA's regulatory overreach. Um, and we've gotten some great uh, grants to do shellfish breeding for disease resistance. And we've got a strong coalition of genetics researchers. I'm really excited about the next uh, 10 years of growing oysters and clams uh, on the East Coast. Um, and that we have challenges with Vibrio detection, which is a naturally occurring bacterium that's everywhere, um, can be a problem in summer. Um, and harmful algal blooms uh, detection, and, and certainly I would love to see more efforts uh, involved in mitigating harmful algal blooms, but that's a huge challenge. And I think that's my next, my last slide. Oh, well, this is our breeding center work. Um, we are got some new ARS uh, funding to hire new geneticists up north, and we are looking forward to expanding our family trials up and down the coast to develop regionally adapted disease resistant lines. And maybe that's my last slide. And I'd be happy to take any questions uh, through the chat box or at the end of the show. Our second speaker is Deborah Bouchard. Hello everyone, again, my name is Debbie Bouchard and I'm the director of the University of Maine's Aquaculture Research Institute and an aquatic animal health specialist with UMaine's Cooperative Extension. Today I'll present a broad overview of aquaculture in Maine, its supporting research and extension resources, and a few examples of new major research and education initiatives currently underway that support Maine and the nation's growing aquaculture industry. Next, please. In 2020, the Maine Department of Marine Resources reported the value of Maine aquaculture species in Maine at over 88.4 million. While most of this revenue is generated from Atlantic salmon farming, the Maine aquaculture sector is rapidly expanding in the farming of shellfish and sea vegetables. Eastern oyster aquaculture has expanded from 1 million in landed value in 2011 to 9.6 million in 2019. Mussel aquaculture revenue has almost quadrupled between 2011 and 2019. And just between 2018 and 2019, the value of marine algal harvests has, has also quadrupled. Leases that allow shellfish other than mussels and oysters have increased tenfold since 2011. This expansion can also be seen in the number of active limited purpose aquaculture leases, which have grown from 44 in 2007 to, to 769 in 2020. Maine has greater than 24 aquaculture species, 190 established farms, and as mentioned, well over 700 active limited purpose aquaculture leases. In total, Maine farms uses approximately 1,700 ocean acres, which by comparison is actually a small portion of the state's 3,500 mile coastline. Next. For a perspective on the developing industry in marine space usage, a limited purpose aquaculture or LPA lease is a one year lease of no more than 400 square feet. All total LPAs use less than eight ocean acres with all being for shellfish and seaweed growers. 
Experimental leases are up to four acres and a duration of three years. Maine currently has 62, with most for shellfish followed by seaweed that occupy a bit over 200 acres. Standard leases are up to 100 acres and can be for up to 20 years. Maine has 84 standard leases led in number by shellfish, next finfish, and right now four for seaweed. Standard leases use approximately 850 acres in total. Next slide. Maine has also seen a surge in companies interested in establishing large land-based recirculating aquaculture systems in the state. Recirculating aquaculture systems, referred to as RAS, are an emerging technology with a substantial potential to expand and add resilience to domestic finfish aquaculture. Currently, Maine has six RAS facilities in various stages of development, proposing to produce salmon, eel, yellowtail, and trout, and are projecting a capital investment of $1 billion and production levels of near 50,000 tons. These new land-based companies, once established, will clearly have a positive impact on Maine's economy and increase domestic farm seafood production. Next. So what are some of the factors driving the economic development of aquaculture in Maine? Market demand and relative proximity to markets, new investor confidence, Maine's high quality seafood reputation, and Maine's abundant groundwater and clean seawater clearly help drive economic development. Along with a strong advocacy association, the Maine Aquaculture Association, other key factors are that Maine's aquaculture and industry has solid research and extension resources and new, event, new initiatives for workforce development. Next. I'll take this opportunity to present the University of Maine's research and extension assets, along with a few new research and education programs. New Maine's Aquaculture Research Institute was established in 2009 and is publicly funded. Our mission is to serve Maine as an objective authority on aquaculture research with the goal of advancing a sustainable aquaculture future in Maine and the nation. We serve the stakeholders of Maine and work closely with industry, regulatory, educational, and environmental nonprofits to answer emerging aquaculture research questions. Next, please. Under our strategic framework, we encompass four broad ca research categories, aquatic animal health, aquatic species biology and reproduction, ecological dimensions of aquaculture, and the all important social dimensions of aquaculture. Next. UMaine has aquaculture facilities across the state that engage with the industry directly. ARI works collaboratively with these groups and facilities to greatly enhance aquaculture research and education. The Aquatic Animal Health Laboratory located in Orono is a state-of-the-art biocontainment laboratory designed to conduct advanced research on aquatic animal pathogens. It also serves as an industry contract research for development of vaccines, functional feeds, and other aquatic animal health products. Located in Franklin, the Center for Cooperative Aquaculture Research is a unique commercial scale land-based RAS R&D facility and a business incubator. Two of Maine's new RAS companies started at this facility. The Darling Marine Center located in Walpole is UMaine's marine laboratory. In collaboration with the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center, business incubator space is also available here. The center also has an experimental farm site to test field performance of new developing and various shellfish and seaweed species. The Downeast Institute is UMaine's Machias Marine Science Field Station and is a shellfish production and research facility. Staff have the ability to culture as many as nine different species of commercially important shellfish. Lastly, for facilities, but important for seafood product development, is the Dr. Matthew Highlands food plant located on the UMaine campus. This facility is equipped with a variety of food processing equipment and also offers industry services. Next slide. 
I'll move on now to just two examples of significant research, research initiatives working directly with the industry that impact aquaculture in Maine and beyond. The University of Maine is the home of the Maine Sea Grant Program. In 2019, project funding received through the National NOAA Sea Grant Aquaculture Program by Maine Sea Grant established the Maine Aquaculture Hub Project. The Maine Aquaculture Hub is coordinated by six Maine organizations and was created to strengthen aquaculture in Maine. To date, the hub has engaged more than 50 organizations and 150 individuals to discuss the future of aquaculture in Maine. The project will also invest more than 200,000 of NOAA dollars in five aquaculture innovation projects to address barriers for the aquaculture industry. Next, well, you'd actually stay on that one. <laughs> on a national level, Maine Sea Grant and ARI are key collaborators in a NOAA Sea Grant project with Maryland, Maine, and Wisconsin for building capacity of land-based Atlantic salmon aquaculture in the U.S. The project now in its second year has established a recirculating salmon network, RASTIN, the network consortium made up of industry stakeholders, academic institutes, and the biotechnology sector bring together critical knowledge and skills for success in domestic salmon RAS. The RAS network will analyze the current status of RAS technology, address barriers to its development as stated by the industry, and provide a clear national plan to ensure economic, environmental, and social su success. Next slide. I'll finish today with a bit on new workforce uh, development initiatives. A recent Focus Maine Aquaculture Workforce Development Report highlighted the importance of experiential learning, industry-focused credentials, and supporting community colleges in meeting aquaculture workforce needs. With that, ARI is developing a certificate in sustainable aquaculture that includes hands-on intensive courses in aquatic animal husbandry, aquatic animal health, shellfish culture, and recirculating aquaculture systems. The courses will be offered to both the general public through UMaine Cooperative Extension and to UMaine undergraduate students through the School of Marine Sciences. This certificate program concludes with an industry internship program that provides paid undergraduate industry internships at aquaculture businesses regulatory agencies, and nonprofits throughout Maine. This program is uniquely poised to address workforce development needs by placing interns directly within industry to grow occupational competencies. We are also working with Washington County Community College to access synergies between our certificate program and their technical skills training. We can provide the training space and hands-on learning in fish biology, aquatic systems and husbandry techniques, while Washington County Community College can provide training and useful skills such as plumbing, electrical, and mechanics. These combined programs can help to create a well-rounded workforce needed by a growing aquaculture industry. Next. I'll close here. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions now or you know at the end of this, this meeting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Timothy Sullivan. Uh, so as Gal said, I'm a national program leader uh, at NIFA. I've been with NIFA for approximately eight months and my background is aquaculture and animal health. And those are the areas where I manage programs uh, within USDA NIFA. So for today, I'm gonna be presenting a little bit of an overview about NIFA and about research funding available for aquaculture specifically at NIFA. And through that, I will also highlight currently active projects that are applicable and uh, on, ongoing within the Northeast. Next slide, please. So NIFA is, is really the USDA's extramural funding arm. Uh, we work with uh, universities, land grant universities and other universities, as well as small businesses to fund both research that addresses complex issues facing society and also education and extension programs. Next slide, please. 
So this is a graph. It's a few years old now, but many of these numbers are, are consistent today. And it shows the five-year average uh, for NIFA's aquaculture specific funding, which is approximately 20 to $21 million per year. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna be talking specifically today about competitive grant funding. Um, and I won't talk much about uh, capacity grant funding like hatch projects and the like. NIFA has approximately or a little more than 30 competitive programs that have applicability for universities and small businesses. The bulk of NIFA's competitive funding comes through AFRI, the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative. And I'm gonna highlight two specific RFAs, the Foundational and Applied Sciences. This funds uh, primarily individual projects from PDs from institutions around the country. And then the Sustainable Agricultural Systems. These are much larger projects with budgets that approach $10 million and they are fully integrated. So they have to be large in scope. Um, and have to include research extension and education. There are three uh, specific research programs that are non-AFRI that NIFA engages in, and they're all dedicated uh, specifically to aquaculture. So the, the special research program for aquaculture research, the SBIR has a priority area for aquaculture, and then the regional aquaculture centers uh, that program funds five centers around the country that conduct regionally important aquaculture research. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the slide. So, or the end of the talk. Next slide, please. So AFRI, as I said, is NIFA's largest competitive program. There are six uh, priority areas. They are from the farm bill and most of the aquaculture research falls within animal health and production and animal products but some of the aquaponics research is also applicable within plant health and production and plant products next slide please so the afri sas program which i already talked a little bit about has four sort of program priorities sustainable ag intensification agricultural climate adaptation, value added innovation, and food and nutrition translation. And I already said these are supposed to be integrated projects and they're expected to significantly improve the supply of agricultural products while supporting economic prosperity and rural development in the United States. Next slide, please. So there is one uh, current SAS project that is related to aquaculture. It's housed at the University of Maryland and the lead uh, PD is Dr. Yu. It's transforming shellfish farming with smart technology and management practices for sustainable production. So that project was, it began, I believe last year. And the objectives are listed if anyone wants to see them. Next slide, please. So the, the aquaculture research program, the special research, this makes awards to individual PDs of up to $300,000 for two year projects. They are directed to be applied aquaculture research that one, directly addresses major constraints to the US aquaculture industry and two, focuses on around one of our four program area priorities, which are genetics, disease, production systems, or economics. Next slide, please. And these are a few of the active awards that are within the Northeast. The first is a, is a COVID economic analysis from Virginia Polytechnical. The second is a, a decision support system for sea lice management from the University of Maine. And the third is from Rutgers, and it looks at product attributes and post pandemic consumer demand. So it's also in some ways an economic study that relates to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So the next program that I wanna highlight is the SBIR program. So this is a, a program that's that a number of federal agencies run. NIFA runs one 
SBIR. Um, and we have a program for aquaculture specifically. And this is this funds small businesses for projects that have commercial potential. There are five priorities that we have reproductive efficiency, genetic improvement, integrated aquatic animal health, improved production systems and management strategies, and also algal production. So the initial awards are made for $100,000 in eight months, and awardees are then able to submit to a phase two round, which is a larger uh, project duration, two years, and also an expanded budget of $600,000. Next slide, please. And this is just a few of the Northeast related projects that have gone on in the last couple of years. So a couple of them are focused on seaweed, uh, some diagnostic development, IHNV, and we routinely fund a number of, of uh, shellfish related projects. The one at the bottom was uh, a mobile hatchery for producing shellfish seed stock. Next slide, please. The last program I wanted to highlight was the regional aquaculture centers. So this program funds research, well, it funds aquaculture centers at five universities. The one in the Northeast is housed at the University of Maryland. The director of that center is uh, Reggie Harrell. And those centers receive funding from NIFA, and then they solicit RFAs and work with their technical advisory committees uh, to decide what projects they receive will have the largest regional impact for aquaculture in their sector of the country. And they make single or multi-year awards through those programs. So this is a really, really unique program uh, that I think has a lot of impact regionally for different sectors of the aquaculture community. So if, if folks in the Northeast are interested, uh, you can email me and I can put you in touch with Reggie if you'd like to know more about his center and the work that they do. Um, yeah, so with that, I'd just like to say that I, I really wanna thank Seafair for giving me the opportunity to talk about NIFA's work in aquaculture with you all. And I look forward to seeing any questions that folks put in the chat box. Thank you all very much. Our next speaker is Tessa Getches. Uh, my name is Tessa Getches, and I'm an aquaculture specialist with Connecticut Sea Grant and the Yukon Extension Program. I've had the pleasure of working with several of today's panelists on a number of research, outreach, and policy projects over the years, um, but this year has certainly posed some unique challenges. So I thought it'd be valuable to talk with you about um, the response to assist the industry during this pandemic. But first, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I'll provide a brief overview of the aquaculture sector in Connecticut. Next slide, please. So Connecticut has a diverse aquaculture industry with both marine and inland farms. Uh, go back one, thanks. Our farmers produce a variety of products, including shellfish, seaweed, fish, bait fish, corals, and hydroponic vegetables. But oysters and clams are the major crops, as Bob had mentioned, and they by far represent the majority of sales. We're also fortunate in Connecticut to have three aquaculture-based high schools. Those provide hands-on training in aquaculture production, seafood processing, and other fields. Connecticut is also home to NOAA's Milford Aquaculture Laboratory, and we have a number of scientists, economists, and others that are focused on various aspects of aquaculture research and development. And our state also has a dedicated aquaculture bureau that's responsible for managing leases, permits, harvest, and sale. Um, and they also have a number of other tasks that they do, including water quality sampling, disease testing, monitoring for harmful algal blooms, um, et cetera. Our shellfish sector is a $30 million industry with more than 50 companies and over 300 employees. And that industry until this year has been growing and diversifying. Slide, please. So COVID-19 halted or slowed most of that growth, both here in Connecticut and across the country. And since the majority of oysters and clams are eaten in restaurants, as Bob said, when those establishments were closed, the shellfish market essentially collapsed. 
And the hurt wasn't short term, it continued for months. In fact, it still continues for most businesses. Um, and at first farmers couldn't move their current crop, but then what happened is they found it difficult to plan for future seasons, which is still ongoing. And while many small businesses were getting state and federal aid, there certainly were concerns about the type of assistance that would be available for the aquaculture industry. Slide, please. But pretty quickly, a number of individuals and organizations stepped up to the plate to help document and communicate the impacts and advocate for compensation. So I wanted to give you just a few examples of this before I hone in on the Connecticut response. Slide, please. One of the key projects that was previously mentioned helped to document the broader impacts to the aquaculture industry was a study by Jonathan Van Zetten. He's an economist and extension specialist at Virginia Tech, and he his colleagues have been conducting quarterly surveys since last year. And they recently published this report, which has been used to communicate the widespread impacts that the pandemic had. Uh, their key finding was that the disruption of the traditional marketing channels resulted in what they call a cascade of effects, including the loss of jobs, revenue, and market share. And as with many small businesses that we've probably all seen in day to day, aquaculture operations have had difficulty securing the inputs and the services that they need. So it's really put a damper on their operations. Next slide, please. But with the results of their survey and more detailed state survey responses, people have been able to communicate the losses and advocate, as I mentioned, for additional funding. Um, the major successes include changes to CARES Act funding for shellfish farmers. So for example, in some states, regulators petitioned to change the NOAA CARES Act funding allocation so that a greater percentage of funds were dedicated to aquaculture. And as a result of tireless efforts by groups like the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association and others, the USDA portion of the CARES Act funding, which has been the largest pot of funding to date, was extended to shellfish producers. So that was a huge effort. Uh, and what was really key was that these groups made sure that our elected officials um, and our appointed officials were aware of the scale of the impacts to these small businesses so that they could advocate for further funding. For example, in Connecticut, we brought USDA officials to farms to discuss the challenges. And in this picture, you see our governor, Ned Lamont, and Congressman Joe Courtney, who visited one of our local shellfish farmers, actually a number of farms, to learn about how COVID was affecting them. Next slide, please. Um, in another example, last spring, the National Sea Grant Office implemented a grant program that provided funding for each state program to rapidly respond to the needs of the industry. And they left that up to the states to have their extension specialists and management staff to work with industry, to work with managers, to decide what was best for those states. Um, one of the interesting programs was that they implemented an oyster buyback program. And so they purchased thousands of bushels of oversized oysters from industry and then worked with state agencies to plant those on natural beds and reef restoration projects. And that project, uh, that program is now being adopted as a model for other locations. So you may have heard of the Nature Conservancy um, and Partners Program. They've set aside $2 million to purchase and plant oversized oysters uh, across the country. So they'll be supporting a lot of businesses and jobs through this effort. And one other effort, um, again, thanks to Bob Rowe and his um, team of producers, the USDA's Agriculture Marketing Service has approved a program that involves the purchase of uh, millions of dollars worth of farm, farm clams that will be then transferred to food banks, food banks, excuse me. Um, so again, there, there's been quite an oversupply of product and this will help farmers with some much need, needed income during that time. Next slide, please. So there have been examples like these and others from around the country, and I wanted to finish up the presentation by walking you through um, our response here in Connecticut. Um, the situation was, can you skip to the next slide? Thanks, perfect. Um, the situation was pretty dire with revenue down more than 90% compared to the previous um, year or that period. Um, and we've seen this across the Northeast with hundreds of, of employees being laid off. And coming into spring of last year, the oysters were growing beyond the acceptable market size. In Connecticut, we actually have a market size, a minimum of 
three inches, which is large um, in contrast to most other states. And so we're already at a little bit of a competitive disadvantage. Um, and when those oysters were going beyond that three inches, uh, our farmers were pretty nervous. Um, so product also started to accumulate on the farms. Next slide, please. So what we needed to do was first understand the extent of the damage to the industry. And so we surveyed them to fully understand that and be able to communicate that. And because of our strong working relationship with our Department of Agriculture, um, we updated guidance on direct sales. We helped to facilitate sales by creating a website, um, just trying to move and shuffle things around uh, to help producers, but it really wasn't enough. I mean, what they needed at the time was to be able to get cash in their hands to pay their employees. Next slide, please. And so one of the opportunities that we had during the time was to work with the industry to rehabilitate our natural beds. We already had a plan and process to rehabilitate these beds. We have over 7,000 acres that are managed as, uh, by the state and they serve as a source of oyster seed for the industry. But they had fallen into poor condition over the last several years and were silted over. Um, some of the beds didn't really have a lot of brood stock, uh, which limited their reproductive capacity. And so working together with the state, we were able to secure funds, um, some from Sea Grant and some from the state, to keep the industry working while these markets were closed. And the project was comprised of three phases, and industry members were eligible to apply and participate in one of the three phases. So the first involved the rehabilitation of a portion of these natural beds, and the state actually opened these up to be harvested for clams. So there were some portions where there wasn't really any oyster substrate, but there were clams. So the state allowed the farmers to come in and harvest the clams and then later to go replant that substrate. And so uh, they were able to hold on to those clams. Many of them still have them on their private beds for later sale. So that was their compensation. Um, in phase two, there were other beds that needed to be rehabilitated, but they didn't have clams on them. They just needed uh, more substrate or broodstock. And so uh, because there, was no, there were no clams, uh, those participants received a set cash payment for their efforts. And then in the final phase, participants were able to sell any oversized oysters they had available, and they received a payment for that crop. And so those oysters were planted in areas closed areas of the natural beds that had previously had um, limited natural food stock. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple of pictures of people moving vast quantities of shell and food stock. Next slide, please. And um, these are some fuzzy video pictures. We have a lot of algae in Long Island Sound. So um, not great visibility, but um, there was video monitoring of this entire effort that was conducted by the State Bureau of Aquaculture. So they're showing um, these particular photos are one area of the natural bed before the enhancement work and on the right after the enhancement work. And they're continu continuing those video assessments. And there's also, um, we applied for additional funding to continue this work in the future. Next slide. So this project resulted in some key environmental outcomes. Um, we were able to uh, reach about 1,800 acres uh, and plant three acres with broodstock. Um, the industry was able to remove silt, biofouling, um, reclaim shell that had been buried, improving the condition of the bed. And the result was increased surface area for recruitment and structure for the oysters. And the increased probability, we hope that recruitment will, will occur in subsequent seasons. Um, and we hope by doing this, although we haven't um, conducted any research to date, but that um, this work will result in improvement of the ecological services that these beds are providing. So improved water quality, erosion control, habitat for other marine organisms. So that will all be part of future work. Next slide, please. So while this was a relatively small effort, there, was, there were some significant impacts. Um, as you can see in this slide, um, the three phases in total, along with um, the NOAA funding that was received, about 440,000. Um, there was 
$1.9 million. Um, that would um, for payment for clams. And then phase two was the direct payments for work. Those were C grant funds. Phase three were C grant funds to pay for oysters. Um, and then there, this really helped to minimize flooding in the shellfish markets. And we're hoping that that will continue. It definitely prevented price drops and it offered some alternative marketing strategies, especially for those clams. Next slide, please. So we did reach our overall goal to retain jobs, businesses, and revenue, but we recognize that there's a lot more that needs to be done to make these businesses whole again. Uh, but we did engage about 70% of the industry in this project, our shellfish industry at least. And in surveying them, we knew that cash flow was a problem and that we helped them and that's going to be a problem going forward. Um, we did get people back to work sooner and it looks like to be a pretty good model going forward because there are um, thousands of acres of shellfish beds that still need to be rehabilitated and the state is very interested in looking at long-term funding and working with the industry to do that. They all have vessel monitoring um, devices on their boats and so we can track the work um, where the rehabilitation was done and oysters were planted. Next slide, please. So over the last year, we've seen many businesses use their personal savings. And they wanted to avoid taking loans. There are a lot of other different pots of money, uh, but it hasn't been evenly distributed among the businesses and it doesn't fully represent the extent of losses that they've had. Next slide, please. You know, our industry has told us that it was great to have this rapid assessment and response. Um, we know that we worked really great among agencies and that we've helped provide some cash flow. Um, but even though these, these industry folks have adapted to a completely business, different business model, it's really, the outlook is still bleak for many of them. Um, it's a very slow recovery. Our restaurants are kind of going back and forth with opening, closing, reducing capacity, and that's, that's really killing folks right now. Uh, next slide. But looking ahead, even though there's still uncertainty about the market and distribution, our industry members are still engaged. They're very resilient. Like I said, many of them use their savings. They did not take out loans. Um, they're still working together to explore direct marketing, um, different types of markets, value added products. We actually have two hatcheries, um, one that is expanding, one that is a very large hatchery that's um, been proposed. Uh, so I think even though, you know, some of the future looks bleak, there are some, some clear opportunities uh, in Connecticut and throughout our region. And so I just wanted to acknowledge those hardworking individuals and those people who have come together to support the industry over the last year. And I'll take any questions at the end. Thanks. Our final speaker is Mike DeLuca. Hey, all. I just want to note uh, that in addition to my position in the research office, I also direct the Aquaculture Innovation Center at Rutgers. And that is a part of the Haskins Shellfish uh, Research Lab, which I think is pretty well known among the, uh, the research community. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is touch briefly on a, on a few key topics. I'll give you a very brief overview of the, the industry uh, in New Jersey, follow up on, on Tessa's comments with some of the COVID impacts to the industry and how the industry responded to that uh, in New Jersey, and focus the majority of my remarks on some of the challenges that remain to um, uh, advance and expand the industry in, in New Jersey. Uh, talk a little bit about offshore aquaculture and then uh, finish up with, uh, with a call for some um, support for key research needs. Next slide. So in New Jersey, um, you know, much of the state's aquaculture focuses on uh, two shellfish um, species, oysters uh, and uh, hard clams. Um, these are the latest stats uh, available for a number of farms and oysters sold and farm gate value. We see we had about 20 oyster farms and roughly 20 hard clam farms. Um, Two million oysters sold in 2019 with a farm gate value of one and a half million. And the farm gate value for hard clams was 2.25 million. These figures uh, are most likely underestimates because the, the surveys that are conducted 
um, by uh, ag and cooperative extension and others are not mandatory. Uh, so some farmers don't, uh, don't participate uh, in these. Next slide. Okay, I spent a little time on the, uh, the COVID pan pandemic here. Uh, obviously, it arrived in 2020. Things dr uh, changed dramatically for many of us, uh, including the shellfish aquaculture uh, industry. Um, and I guess one of the, the primary uh, impacts was the, the closure of the markets for, for fresh uh, shellfish. It's really hit uh, small seafood businesses very, very hard. Many restaurants uh, closed in the market for shell, uh, fresh shellfish uh, dried up. And many of these uh, restaurants still remain closed or are out of business uh, altogether. So one of the things my colleagues at uh, Rutgers did with their um, state colleagues, uh, including um, New Jersey Shellfish Council, New Jersey Aquaculture Association, and Rutgers Cooperative Extension, was to um, conduct a survey of the impacts to the shellfish aquaculture uh, industry. And here you see some of the uh, responses uh, um, very in line with the uh, stats that uh, Tessa presented for Connecticut. Uh, most uh, shellfish growers lost sales and about 70% of the shellfish growers sold exclusively to, to restaurants. So uh, they were in, in dire, dire straits. Okay, next slide. Okay, Tessa mentioned the, uh, the seat grant rapid response grants that were available to uh, state aquaculture uh, industries. In New Jersey, um, one of my colleagues, Lisa Calvo, who's an aquaculture extension agent and brain scientist at Rutgers, um, received some of this competitive grant funding to help the industry survive during the pandemic. And what she did was she used this funding uh, to repurpose oysters that had grown beyond market size for restoration projects uh, in New Jersey. This model was also used by, by other Northeastern uh, coastal states and copied uh, by them. But the key to the success of the program was organizing a partnership with uh, state, federal government, um, academe, and the, the inter industry. And it resulted in 76,000 oysters that were planted for habitat restoration in Delaware Bay and the Mullock River Great Bay uh, estuary. There were 16 farmers that participated in, in it. And there were a couple of legacy features of this uh, program, one of which was the creation of a shellfish exchange that serves as a broker to link shellfish growers with future restoration projects. So some um, cause for optimism for the future. The other, other legacy feature was the opportunity for shellfish growers to diversify their business. Uh, that is producing shellfish for nature-based restoration projects uh, down the line. And of course, uh, as was mentioned previously, there are a variety of other CARES Act related um, programs um, available to shellfish uh, farmers. And the Sea Grant Law Center in particular provided some, some nice um, advice and guidance for the, uh, for the uh, community. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, in New Jersey, there's a, a lot of potential for growth of the industry, but as Bob was uh, noting in his opening uh, remarks, there are a lot of challenges that need to be addressed in order for that expansion to, to occur. Uh, one of these is user conflicts, uh, competing uses um, for uh, waters in the coastal zone. Uh, there are a lot of other um, competing demands for um, our coastal, coastal waters. And there's also conflicts that arise periodically. Um, one of the most recent ones in New Jersey was with the listing of the red knot as threatened. This is a migratory um, shorebird. And a major stopover for this bird is Delaware Bay. And that occurs in the spring, early May to, to June, when horseshoe crabs are spawning and the birds rely on the high nutrient horseshoe crab eggs to complete a major migration from South America to the Arctic uh, to, to breed. And so the federal and state government uh, implemented a, a very precautionary um, program to ensure that the potential impacts of shellfish farmers that also used uh, this area were not 
uh, impeding the foraging success of the, the red knots. There's a whole um, uh, bureaucratic uh, array of meetings and committees that have been uh, designed to address these issues and review the conservation measures. I'd be happy to go into more detail in that during the, the Q&A uh, section. But the bottom line is that we can expect more of these uh, conflicts to occur in the future among various coastal uses and users of our, our coastal zone. And it just underscores the, the need for proactive approaches and strategies to mitigate these conflicts. And one of the, the efforts that's uh, underway in New Jersey is the development of a GIS-based GIS uh, or web-based tool that will help inform um, siting of future aquaculture operations, taking into account some of the existing and planned uh, uses of our, our coastal, coastal waters. There are also, um, uh, New Jersey, you know, as, as Bob mentioned, uh, also has a relatively complex regulatory system that governs uh, aquaculture. Uh, in New Jersey, there are nine divisions of state government that have some authority over aquaculture uh, operations, obviously federal government involvement and an interstate uh, regulatory uh, commission. These are all involved in licensing, permitting, leasing, and governance of shellfish uh, aquaculture. In addition, uh, superimposed on all this, is the fact that the laws that are being used to uh, administer shellfish aquaculture in New Jersey were designed for the wild fisheries. <clears throat> and um, really it's a, a shoehorning in of uh, shellfish uh, aquaculture. Wild fisheries and shellfish that are farmed are very, uh, two very different resources. One is the public trust resource. The other is a resource owned by the farmer. And in my opinion, this requires a, a major review of the legislation and authorities in New Jersey to help make it easier for new entrants to get into the, uh, into the business. There are obviously a, a number of other major impediments uh, to growth of the industry, disease, mortality, uh, lack of crop diversity. Um, Rutgers Haskin Lab has been working on developing some new culture candidates to increase crop diversity. These are uh, surf clams and base gallops, a lot of success with those. And in fact, um, seed stock uh, for those will be made available this year through our, our hatchery. But I really wanted to focus on one of the key challenges uh, facing the industry and that's uh, climate change. And we've seen some of these um, impacts uh, already. Severe and more frequent precipitation events are expected to lead to greater uh, freshwater inputs. Uh, we've seen uh, waters, uh, warmer waters shifting uh, northward that could lead to associated population shifts for species that can adapt to uh, these newer changing environmental condition. The ecosystem changes that we're um, about to see or expected to see are likely to impact the distribution and prevalence of disease, particularly those that correlate to salinity, uh, temperature, and uh, those impacting uh, human health. It's very likely that uh, phytoplankton production, phytoplankton production will also be impacted by these uh, shifts um, due to environmental change. Phytoplankton are a key food source for shellfish and uh, are likely to be impacted. So uh, the examination of climate change and the potential consequent shifts in environmental conditions is really an essential element to inform management of shellfish aquaculture and to help sustain the, the state's industry and really the industry uh, in general. Next slide, please. Okay, there have been uh, a few pilot projects to uh, conduct um, aquaculture in federal waters. In New Jersey, uh, we're seeing um, wind energy uh, make some uh, advances and it's likely to uh, actually occur in the, in the near, near future. Uh, wind energy uh, provides platforms upon which the turbines are stationed and obviously platforms for conducting uh, aquaculture uh, as well. Uh, a number of environmental baseline studies are underway and the initiative is, is advancing. However, there's no uh, uh, stable legal regulatory regime uh, in place uh, from the federal government. 
one of the attempts to address this has been introduced by a number of senators. Uh, Wicker, Rubio, and Schatz have introduced an Aquaculture Act, a National Aquaculture Act, that uh, would establish um, a permitting and management system for offshore aquaculture in federal waters. Would also direct NOAA to lead an R&D uh, grant program, authorize the Office of Aquaculture at NOAA, and also uh, encourage um, the R&D uh, effort to capitalize on existing programs such as uh, Sea Grant. A number of um, organizations have been tracking this legislation, and of course, it has to be reintroduced into the uh, the new uh, Congress. Uh, one of these groups is the National Association of um, Green Labs, which has produced a position statement on the uh, the bill and encourages uh, the bill to separate the, the R&D grant program from the poly policy making and administration of the program, which is really important to ensure the integrity of the, uh, the research program. So offshore aquaculture is emerging. It's an opportunity, but it comes with some uh, much needed uh, work. Next slide, please. Wanted to comment. Um, briefly on uh, research, which is so critical to the expansion of the, the industry and for it to occur in an environmentally sustainable manner. Uh, here are two key uh, research priority areas that I believe are uh, going to be receiving more attention and uh, more funding. Uh, I already alluded to the first one when I spoke about um, climate change, uh, developing a research program to understand how environmental shifts in a variety of parameters uh, will affect uh, shellfish habitat, distribution, diseases, and uh, food sources. And in fact, um, I was on a call this morning with some of my coastal zone management uh, colleagues, and they in fact um, uh, produce a list of um, program priorities each year along with uh, the Coastal States Organization, which is an umbrella organization for all the state-based coastal management programs uh, in the country. And this um, research priority is one that's the top on, on their list. So that's, uh, that's good to see. The other uh, research priority is to optimize culture of uh, shellfish for a broad range of, of coastal environments. This is where shellfish uh, genetics and selection uh, come into play. That's a topic being pursued uh, by my colleagues at Rutgers and the Haskin Lab, uh, among uh, others. The bottom line is that we, we need to uh, continue to invest in aquaculture research. Tim um, uh, mentioned a number of uh, programs uh, that are related to aquaculture, and we need, all need to work together to ensure that there's robust funding for these types of uh, programs. I think the next slide is my final one. And just to, to summarize that in New Jersey, we have you know, tremendous potential for growth of the the, the industry, uh, we do have to address uh, user conflicts in the coastal zone, as Tessa mentioned and others, you know, COVID impacts will continue and we, we uh, need to continue to provide some innovative programs to enable this um, industry to uh, survive. You have to be proactive in addressing the, the use conflicts that uh, have emerged and will continue to, to uh, appear. Diversification is important important for the sustainability of the industry. I mentioned two culture candidates that uh, are being developed uh, in New Jersey for uh, grow out, uh, base gallops and uh, surf clams. We need to have a stable legal regime for offshore aquaculture uh, to develop. Be interesting to see um, if this new Congress takes up this uh, act proposed by uh, the, the senators. Uh, and it's an opportunity for all of us to ensure that that act addresses the needs of the industry. And then climate change, of course, is a huge issue that uh, this new administration has made one of its top four uh, priorities. And uh, there's a lot of um, funding that I believe will be coming down the pike to address climate change impacts. And we need to ensure that some of that funds gets directed to standing up uh, this industry and ensuring that it's sustainable in the face of uh, climate change. And that's my last point, uh, continued support for research and innovation to enable this um, industry to advance and uh, grow. So that's the um, end of my presentation. I would encourage our um, policy colleagues on the call on the Hill to ensure that uh, 
we do continue to see some robust funding for um, aquaculture. Before we wrap up, we wanted to point out that CFER is online at CFER.org and encourage those who enjoyed this webinar to sign up for our newsletter where you will get more information on similar events. Our next event will be on February 26, 2021. It's a follow-up event to an event we had at the end of August and will be on the topic of SNAP and TFP. And we will be sending more information in the coming week or two uh, for anyone interested. We're also on Twitter and all our programs are available on our YouTube channel, including this one in a week from now. Uh, you can find it by searching our name on YouTube. That's the Council on Food Agriculture and Resource Economics. Please follow us and subscribe. We also encourage any and all inquiries, please contact us at information at cfer.org. Next slide. We want to give a big, big thank for our panelists that took the time and attended this uh, session. Uh, we also want to thank the audience. We're passionate about this subject and we think you are too but it's not a small thing to plan to give up a lunch hour. It's a bit more, it's almost an hour and a half to spend it with us. And we wanna ask you to do one more thing and that's to follow us on Twitter. We hope you enjoyed this event as much as we enjoyed hosting.